your guide to peas. These small, spherical fruits, yep, technically, they're fruits, are a staple on so many dinner plates around the world. Originating from Western Asia and Northern Africa, peas are high in many vitamins and minerals. They make a wonderful addition to soups and pot pies and are also delicious cooked on their own. There are a few different types for you to choose from. Garden peas, smooth seeds. They have a higher starch level and are more often used to produce ripe seeds for split peas. They can also be used as dry beans. Wrinkled seeds, generally sweeter in taste and are preferred for home use. Snap peas, a variety that has been developed from garden peas. Their pods are low in fiber and can be snapped and eaten along with the immature peas inside. Snow peas, a type that's harvested as flat and tender pods before the seeds inside can develop at all. Peas are happiest when directly sown into your garden. Their ideal soil temperature for germination is between 65 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 18 to 26 degrees Celsius. And you'll want to get started as soon as your soil is workable in the spring. For a fall harvest, start your peas about eight to 10 weeks before the first expected frost. Plant your seeds about one to two inches, 2.5 to five centimeters deep spacing them one to four inches, 2.5 to 10 centimeters apart, in rows that are about 18 inches, 45 centimeters apart. Keep in mind that if your soil is wet, you'll want to plant them more shallow. If your soil is dry, then plant them deeper. Peas are happiest in soils that have a pH level between 6.0 to 7.0. They are widely adapted, preferring cool, damp weather, and peas can actually tolerate moderate freezes. Their air temperature should stay below 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 26 degrees Celsius, for best germination and growth. As well, though they tolerate light shade, peas yield best in full sun. If you're growing a tall variety, you'll want to install trellises for some added support. If you're using these trellises, just make sure to increase the spacing of your plants to about four to six inches, 10 to 15.2 centimeters in their rows. When it comes to watering, avoid heavy watering while your peas are flowering because it can interfere with the pollination process. As well, overwatering leads to wet soil, which promote root rot diseases and slows the growth of your plants. You can try using raised beds when your soil is slow draining, which will decrease the risk of these rot infections. On the other end of the spectrum, drought stress will decrease yield, reduce seed size, and increase the stringiness of your peas pods. You can work one pound of an all-purpose fertilizer and two to three inches, five to 7.6 centimeters of well-composted organic matter into your soil before planting. Peas fix nitrogen from the air. So in general, they don't need more fertilizer after seeding. Be wary of adding any additional nitrogen because although it will result in more leaves, the pods will become smaller and flowering will be delayed. As well, apply mulch, like straw, grass clippings, or wood chips, in the summer heat to help control weeds, keep the soil moist, and reduce soil temperatures for fall planting. Companion plants do's and don'ts. Do's, beans, carrots, cucumber, eggplant, parsley, peppers, potatoes, radish, spinach, strawberries, turnips, all make for great companions. Celery and corn are also great companions since they're heavy feeders, so they'll benefit from the nitrogen fixed in the soil. Don'ts. Avoid planting with onions because they stunt the growth of your peas. Growing structure options. Trellis. 
These are support structures for tall growing vining varieties. Materials that can be used, bamboo canes, coppiced wood, spare sticks, branches from trees, wire fencing, a steel rebar, and nets. Structures the materials can be worked into. A wigwam. Plants are placed in a wide circle with supporting canes tied together at the top. Keep in mind that with this option, you'll lose the planting space in the middle. A central support using just one strong pole in the middle. Strings or wires that can be attached between poles for double rows. An arch over other beds or walkways. A wall or fence. Another option is to plant next to corn so that your pea plants can climb up its strong stem. Containers. They should be at least five inches, 13 centimeters in diameter at the top per plant with enough depth to accommodate your peas roots. Containers are great space savers and can be moved to any spot on your balcony, terrace, or garden. You can still provide trellis support by either placing your container next to a fence or by using one central support in the middle. Just be sure your containers have holes in the bottom for good water drainage. Raised beds. The soil in raised beds drains well and warms up faster, both of which help to prevent disease infections. It also reduces foot traffic around your plants, since you won't have to step on the ground to work. Open field. This option usually provides the most space, as well as lots of opportunities to install your trellises. Here, you can set up arches, wigwams, or double rows made with poles and strings or wires. Another benefit is that you typically don't have to water open garden fields as often as container plantings. Just be sure to check your soil first for its fertilizer needs. You'll also want to make sure there aren't any diseases present in the soil from your last harvest. Aphids. These tiny pests come in a variety of colors, green, black, red, light orange, or yellow, and mainly feed on the undersides of leaves and stems. What they're actually feeding on is the sap in plants, which ends up causing the plants damage. Aphids also leave behind a sticky substance called honeydew, and they are a pest that's known to spread diseases. Aphids can be tolerated by most plants when their numbers are low, but if there's a lot of aphids, they can stunt a plant's growth and cause a plant's leaves to turn yellow and fall off. Here's what to do. For the most part, plants can handle mild aphid infestations. But if they're found, a strong jet of water from a garden hose will wash them off the plants. Spraying plants with water should be done early in the morning so that the plants can dry off during the day. Sticky traps, neem oil, insecticidal soaps, and horticultural oils are also effective against aphids. Just be sure to follow the application instructions on the packaging. Oftentimes, you can also get rid of aphids by wiping or spraying the leaves with a mild solution of water and a few drops of dish soap. One variation includes adding a pinch of cayenne pepper. Soapy water should be reapplied every two to three days or about two weeks. As well, you can try to attract beneficial insects like lady beetles, hoverflies, and lacewings, all of which are important aphid predators. Make sure to check all transplants for aphids before planting. And keep in mind that aphids aren't very mobile, so it's not uncommon to find one heavily affected plant surrounded by plants that are fine. If this is the case, simply remove and destroy the infected plant. Army worms. Army worms are green, reddish, or black caterpillars that heavily feed on the leaves of plants, turning them into skeleton leaves that are filled with lots of irregular or circular shaped holes. These pests are most active in the early morning and the late evening, which are the best times to check for damage. Here's what to do. You can use natural enemies like wasps and flies to help keep army worms in check. Also, if you're using insecticides, it's best to do so in the twilight hours. 
this is when those insecticides will be the most effective. It's also important to control the growth of weeds because they serve as cover for armyworms. Finally, you can simply hand pick any armyworms off the plants. Cabbage Looper Light to dark green caterpillars with wavy white lines on their back and sides and a distinctive arch in their back when they move. They feed on the leaves of a plant, which is also where they hide, causing ragged, large holes to appear. The damage they cause to plants is often quite severe. Cutworms. These are gray worms that curl their bodies around the stem of a plant and feed on it, which causes the plant to be cut off just above the soil surface. When their numbers are high, they can cause severe damage to the garden by causing plants to wilt and die off. Cutworms feed at night and hide in plant debris during the day and they prey more on nutrients plants, seedlings, or young plants since their stems are more tender. There are a number of different types, but the most common are red-backed, dark-sided, and dingy cutworms. Here's what to do. Hand pick any cutworms from the plants after dark, when they're most active. Also, keep a three to four foot buffer of dry soil along the edge of the garden to make it unattractive to cutworms. As well, remove plant residue to help reduce egg-laying sites and get rid of weeds which can host young cutworm larvae. Be sure to till the garden before planting, which helps to expose and kill any larvae that might be present. Also, use compost instead of green manure, since manure might encourage egg lay. As well, try placing aluminum foil or cardboard collars around the plants to create a barrier which will stop cutworm larvae from feeding. Simply place the collars around the plants so that one end is pushed a few inches into the soil and the other end is several inches above the ground. Adding a layer of mulch will also help to prevent any cutworms from reaching the soil surface. And natural predators like wasps and ground beetles also help to control cutworm infestations. Finally, try spreading diametaceous earth essentially a soft powder made from the bones of tiny aquatic creatures around the plant's base. This creates a sharp barrier that will keep cutworms out. Pea Weevil. A brown flecked beetle with a short and wide snout. The female pea weevils lay eggs on young pods and then the weevil larvae feed on the seeds. Here's what to do. Early planting minimizes any exposure to this pest, but if any adult weevils are found on plants, they can be simply hand-picked. Seed Corn Maggot These maggots are yellowish-white in color with a pointed head and no legs. They attack either the seeds or the roots of a plant and are often attracted to seeds when they have already been affected by diseases or insects. When seeds are attacked by seed corn maggots, which is usually while the seeds are germinating, the attack keeps those seeds from growing. Here's what to do. Plant resistant varieties to avoid having a seed corn maggot problem. If these pests are present, then any and all infected seedlings will need to be removed and destroyed. Also, it helps to avoid using heavy compost or manure, since these substances attract the maggot flies that would lay eggs on the plant. Damping off. This is one of the most common problems when starting plants from seed. Seedlings will emerge and appear healthy then suddenly they'll wilt and die for no obvious reason. Damping off is caused by a fungus that thrives in moist conditions, and when soil and air temperatures are above 68 degrees Fahrenheit. It can also thrive when soils have too much nitrogen fertilizer. This fungus favors slow-growing, deeply seeded plants. The stems of affected plants become water-soaked and will eventually collapse while roots become too water-soaked and damaged to function. Older plants can also be affected, and either those older plants become stunted or they will collapse. 
Damping off can be spread three different ways, either in water, by contaminated soil, or on gardening equipment. Here's what to do. When possible, plant disease-free seeds. Keep seedlings moist, but avoid overwatering the seedlings to keep the soil from getting too wet. And try to keep the soil from getting too cold. Raised beds are usually a great option for planting, since raised beds help with drainage. Also, avoid over-fertilizing seedlings, and thin the seedlings out to avoid overcrowding, and to make sure the seedlings are getting good air circulation. If containers are being used, those containers should be thoroughly washed in soapy water and then rinsed in a 10% bleach solution after each use. If any plants are affected with damping off, remove them from the garden and then practice a crop rotation of two to three years. Fusarium wilt. Discolored, brown streaked, or twisted stems and roots are all big indicators of this disease. Abrupt leaf drop is another typical symptom, and leaves can also become downward curling in appearance. Fusarium wilt often won't show itself until plant growth is in the mid to late stages, and it mostly becomes a problem when soil temperatures exceed 70 degrees Fahrenheit, or 21 degrees Celsius. Here's what to do. Plant certified disease-free seeds when possible. Use drip watering methods, or any watering method that focuses on only watering the base of the plant. It's important to avoid splashing the plant while keeping the plant's leaves nice and dry. As well, ensure good ventilation and air movement by spacing plants out properly. This spacing will also help reduce any humidity around the plants. Try to plant as early as possible too. That way plants have more time to develop before soil temperatures reach that critical 70 degrees Fahrenheit. When plants are affected by fusarium wilt, be sure to remove and destroy any diseased leaves. Practice a two to three year crop rotation. And when planting in containers, it's very important to clean them thoroughly before planting. This cleaning process ensures that any bacteria or fungi are killed. P. anation mosaic. A virus transmitted by aphids, P. anation mosaic causes leaves to become crinkled and stunted, and white flecks will appear on the leaves and pods. As well, those pods might also be misshapen. Here's what to do. Plant virus-resistant varieties. Though if these resistant varieties aren't available, then vulnerable varieties can be planted nice and early to help avoid an aphid outbreak. Powdery mildew. Small white patches will appear on the upper and lower leaf surfaces, which might also show some purple blotching. Patches often come together to form a dense powdery layer, coating the leaves and causing the leaves to curl inward. In some cases, eventually the leaves will drop from the plant. Typically, the white patches start on the older leaves and then eventually spread to other plant parts. Powdery mildew is brought on by high humidity and moderate temperatures, 60 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, or 16 to 27 degrees Celsius, with symptoms becoming most severe in shaded areas. As well, this disease often acts as an entry point for other pests and diseases. Here's what to do. First, rotate crops so that members of the same family aren't planted in the same spot year after year. In general, a three-year rotation is a good place to start. Plant disease-resistant varieties when possible, and then provide good air circulation by not crowding the plants and by eliminating weeds. Water plants in the morning to give them enough time to dry out, taking care not to get the plants' leaves wet. Consider spraying infected plants with certain protectant, preventative fungicides. Sulfur, lime sulfur, neem oil, and potassium bicarbonate are all effective, but these remedies will work best when they are used before the infection happens or when signs of the disease are first spotted. Instead of chemical fungicides, 
plants can also be sprayed with a bicarbonate solution by simply mixing one teaspoon of baking soda in one quart of water. Make sure to spray the plants thoroughly since the solution will only kill fungi that it comes into contact with. Also, potassium bicarbonate, which is similar to baking soda, can actually eliminate powdery mildew once it's there and does the job fairly quickly. As well, after the growing season, make sure to dispose of any infected leaves or fruit. Once plants are heavily infected with powdery mildew, it's difficult to get rid of the disease, so focus on preventing it from spreading to other plants. Root rot. A fungal disease that causes plants to become limp, while any terminal leaves, those at the tips of stems, as well as the stems will die off. This is because the roots are no longer able to absorb and move nutrients and water to the rest of the plant. Typically, the lower leaves of an affected plant will turn yellow. Gray, black, or red lesions will also appear on the lower stems and roots. Root rots can affect both seedlings and mature plants. Here's what to do. Plant crops in well-draining soil and water sparingly, allowing the soil to dry before watering. In general, watering once every one to two weeks is enough, but this amount might need to be adjusted to suit the local climate. Also, practice crop rotation and avoid using too much nitrogen in the soil. If a plant has root rot already, dig up the plant and prune out any infected roots, then dust the roots with fungicide powder. If the entire root system is black and mushy, then the entire plant should be destroyed. Harvesting. A good thing to remember is that regular harvesting of your peas will promote continuous pod production, AKA a steady supply of delicious homegrown peas for you to enjoy. Snap peas. Harvest these before the pods are fully mature. In general, pods should be full size and have a firm, crisp flesh, while the seeds inside should be small. Your plant will flower and mature their pods every three to four weeks. But keep in mind that when left on the plant for too long, they'll develop a tough fiber in the pod wall. Garden peas. Pick these pods when the seeds are swollen and make sure to shell them before use. Dry peas. Harvest them when pods are fully mature and are beginning to dry. Simply pull out your plants and lay them down in a row, allowing them to dry for five to seven days. Once dried, you can pick the pods, remove the seeds, then let them dry for another few days. Snow peas. These must be picked regularly to ensure sweet and fiber-free pods. Note, pea plants take nitrogen from the air and store it in their roots. When those roots are left in the ground rather than pulled out, they can be worked into next year's soil, releasing their nitrogen and benefiting your next year's crops. Brassicas like cabbage, broccoli, and cauliflower are great followers since they need plenty of nitrogen to thrive. Storage. Garden and snap peas. Their quality and flavor is best when cooked directly after harvest, but they can also be refrigerated. Dry peas. Keep them in a sealed container in a spot that's both dry and cool. Freezing snap and garden peas. First, you'll want to blanch them in boiling water for about two minutes. This process kills the enzymes that typically reduce nutrients and cause your peas to eventually break down. After blanching, dry your peas thoroughly and then store them in an airtight bag. 